Hi, I'm actor Ian Champion, and welcome to History of Horror Cinema, my podcast series devoted to the good, bad, and the ugly of horror movie history. Please don't forget to like what you hear and hit subscribe. I have such sights to show you. If a Body Meets a Body, 1945 the week before the end of World War II was declared, the Three Stooges released their 86th Columbia short film in August 1945, If a Body Meets a Body, the fourth to stir in chills with the chuckles. The director was Jules White, who was in charge of the studio's comedy shorts division. By 1938, competitors like Hal Roach and Universal were winding down their two reelers in favor of increasing double-feature programs. Columbia, though, was so prolific that the output was split between separate units, one produced by White and the other by Hugh McCollum, who, by handling the business end, freed up White to pursue his love of comedy direction. He had a style rooted very much in the broad gestures and fast pace of his background in silent comedy, as editor for his brother Jack White over at Educational Pictures. Jack was by now working for Jules as writer on his Stooges shorts. Despite the imminent end of World War II, there was a sadder legacy going into this film. It was the first of Curly Howard's films after returning from a stroke. His manic gesturing and physicality gradually began to slow over time, unbeknownst to the team. If a body meets a body is not bad even so, and barely reflects this. The title, incidentally, is taken from Robert Burns's song Coming Through the Rye. The Stooges are, as usual, living a hand-to-mouth existence in penury, struggling with their latest meal of a homemade soup that smells like a dead horse, according to Larry. Sure enough, Mo pulls out a horseshoe from his serving and almost banishes Curly for going to the glue factory instead of the butcher's shop, when Larry spots a newspaper story that their near-excommunicated numbskull, Curly Q. Link, Q for Cufflink, stands to inherit three million dollars from a dead relative. We're filthy with dough. You're filthy without it. This causes some readjustment of Curly's status in the group, and the three hightail it to the will reading at old Professor Bob O. Link's mansion in horror cliché style. There, the gruff police detective Clancy, Fred Kelsey, furthers the familiar plotting by dispelling the assembled relatives' expectations of riches. He reveals that the professor, an experimenter in chemistry, has been murdered. Kelsey bears a striking, though fortunately not lumbering, resemblance to Tor Johnson's detective in Ed Wood's infamous Plan 9 from Outer Space. However, he is not just a better actor, but unusually gets in on the applied violence, by administering a smart triple slap to the boys in line when they demand a password to get back into the drawing room. The sinister butler, Jerkington, wishes the trio good night with, I hope you'll have a nice, long sleep. A famous line taken from Laurel and Hardy's superior comedy horror Oliver the Eighth in 1934. Curly is too jittery to sleep. Mo bullies him to shut up, or I'll blow out your brain, or a reasonable facsimile thereof. The spookiness comes courtesy of the Stooges' attempted bedding down, where Curly is plagued by a skull trundling along the floor on motorized feet, which then sprouts bat wings and a suspended sheet coupled with insane cackling to terrorize all three. A painting trips a sliding door panel that opens to allow the professor's dead body to fall out. This cues a slightly confusing gag where similar-looking bodies turn up wherever the threesome seat cover. It's unclear whether they are meant to be the same person or a pile-up of victims. Ultimately, the murderer and hopeful heir turns out to be the maid, unmasked as a man. This would not be the actor Joe Palmer's last masquerade in a Stooges film, as he helped to save the four films they still had left to finish when Shemp Howard suddenly died of a heart attack in 1955. He posed as a body double for angled shots and the odd line of spoken dialogue in each film to cover for Shemp's absence. A Bird in the Head, 1946 for their fifth short film combining slapstick with horror spoofery, the Three Stooges mock the subgenre of brain-swapping mad scientists and Hollywood horror's ongoing obsession with gorillas. Ever since Ingargi in 1930, The Monster Walks and Murders in the Rue Morgue, both in 1932, then most potently King Kong a year later, our hairy ancestors had fascinated Tinseltown's terror merchants. 
Possibly the public's consciousness of them was renewed after America's Scopes Monkey Trial concerning the teaching of evolution in 1925. Less edifying, A Bird in the Hand, 1946, was the Stooges' 89th short for Columbia, still at this stage retaining the classic lineup of Larry, Moe, and Curly, though by now the latter was starting to show signs that his strokes were gradually impairing his performances. Curly's manic pantomiming side had to be toned down, and understandably Moe was careful to carry out less violent repercussions on him for his lovable stupidity. This was a first writer-director gig for Edward Burns, following his career as a Columbia sound recordist for famed studio director Frank Capra, who'd encouraged him to ask their president Harry Cohn for the chance. Unfortunately, it became a baptism of fire for Burns when he understood the difficulty of shooting around Curly's condition, a situation no one had prepared him for. The shoot took five days in mid-April 1945, which apparently was longer than usual, and was delayed by the death of U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt on the 12th. This time, the boys are incompetent paper hangers doing a day job for a Mr. Beadle, Robert Williams, whose hesitant inquiries into their experience are assuaged by Moe. You won't know the joint when you get back. Good thing he hasn't seen Curly savouring the taste of the lumpy paste and adding seasoning to it. Meanwhile, across the hall is the laboratory of Vernon Dent's Van Dyke-bearded Professor Panzer, a great name for a post-war Nazi, but his accent sounds Eastern European to me. As one of their regular supporting cast, we've already seen Dent trying to exploit a wolfman in idle rumours. Here, he at least has the appearance of medical qualifications to back up his search for a brain to be placed in his gorilla Igor, if I can find one small enough. The name is a misspelled reference to Lugosi's crippled henchman Igor, spelt Y-G-O-R, in Universal's Son of and Ghost of Frankenstein sequels, but this monkey suit is straight out of the bargain basement. Panzer is so desperate for a compact cranium that he asks everyone he meets what hat size they are. Will he ever find a suitable candidate? After Larry and Curly have finished papering Moe into the wall, they present their handiwork to the client, who is less than pleased with the resulting nightmare patchwork festooning his apartment. They flee his anger straight into Panzer's lab, where on hearing Moe calling Curly Birdbrain, the professor beams with maniacal glee. He tests Curly's head with a hammer, producing glockenspiel notes from his noggin and enthusing, Practically unoccupied. Wonderful! The one inventive gag sees Panzer testing Curly with an X-ray fluoroscope, whose screen projects an image of his head containing a cartoon cuckoo clock, a precise blow from the professor's hammer, and the animated cuckoo flops as it extends from its haven. The Stooges are initially terrified by Igor, yet Curly and he make fast friends, to the point where the gorilla menaces Mo whenever he threatens Curly. I was only kidding, Ingagi, quips Mo defensively. This gag's meaning is pretty much lost to modern horror fans, as Ingagi was an obscure curio, a discredited 1930 faux documentary, arguably the first in the found footage genre, essentially a fake filmed record of a Congo expedition uncovering a remote tribe's ritual bestiality with gorillas. Ingagi was later exposed as really being made in Los Angeles, after a viewer reportedly recognized an actor playing one of the tribesmen and stuntman Charles Gamora, who we've earlier seen in my review of Murders in the Who Morgue, played the monkey-suited gorilla in that film, came clean with a signed affidavit, confessing to having portrayed the lead gorilla. The ensuing court case didn't stop it from spawning an unconnected cash-in, son of Ingagi, in 1940. Back to the plot. Igor innocently downs a bottle of surgical pure-grain alcohol, eliciting the rise and fall of a duck whistle as his insides react with internal explosions. Curly copies him, resulting in steam jetting from his ears. The professor has now had enough, and mystifyingly produces a gangster's tommy gun with which to attempt a last-ditch massacre spray of everyone, so much for preserving his single best chance of a brain donor. Igor wrests it from him and goes ape with the gun, destroying equipment and pranging the boys' butts in hiding before pursuing them all down the corridor. In conclusion, a bird in the head is a scattershot monkey shine of very little luster. Thanks for listening. 
And if you like what you've just heard, don't forget to click so. And please hit subscribe. If you build it, they will come.